Ever since we were little, my brother Cody and I were obsessed with supernatural happenings. Ghost sightings, alien abductions, the works. And over the years, we've spent our summers investigating them. We stayed local when we were kids, hunting down stories in our community from newspaper clippings at the library in our town. But as we got older, we branched out, taking our investigating to a national level. A few years ago, after we became bored with the more well-known haunted locations in America, we began our search for places more hidden, places less well-known. That's when we found the Society. The Society is a moderately sized online community of people sharing rumors, coordinates, and information of places that have had supernatural occurrences, massive death tolls, or instances of occult activity. So far, we've only had mild success, about as much as you see on a Ghost Hunters TV show. But two months ago, my brother and I found out about Site 49. Site 49 is a long-abandoned town in the southern part of Utah that was the location of numerous horrific tragedies. Many of the people on the society attest to it being so haunted you'll experience strange occurrences just by being within two miles of the place. One month ago, my brother and I were supposed to track it down together right after our time off from work started. But then my brother and I got into a fight. A big one. Probably the biggest of our lives. I don't want to bore you with too many details, but basically it boils down to me wanting it to be just us, and him wanting to bring Tracy, his girlfriend, with us. Now, I like Tracy fine. She's sweet, and we've always gotten along, but these trips my brother and I take, they're a tradition. A tradition that thus far has been just the two of us. And I liked it that way. I thought he did too. I understand him wanting to bring her, but I just wanted to spend time with my brother. It's the only time we actually get to see each other, as we're so busy throughout the rest of the year with work and family. So I told him I wasn't going. He said, fine, he didn't want me to. And so when he called me during the trip to keep me updated, I ignored him. And when he left me voicemails, I ignored those, too. I only just recently played them and heard what happened. I wish I had picked up the phone. What follows is the transcripts of the voicemails he left me. They were pretty clear, so I'm confident in their accuracy. Voicemail sent May 23rd, 3.51 p.m. Hey, so we finally made it to the motel. Only took about 30 hours. Uh, there's not much to look at. Just a lot of desert for like 400 miles. God, it's hot. He sighs. Anyway, I'll let you know if we find anything. Uh, we better. You wouldn't believe how much we spent on gas. Yeah, I know, you told me not to take the truck. Uh, since when have I ever listened? Alright, I gotta go. Wish you could be here, buddy. Talk soon. Voicemail sent May 23rd, 7.49pm. Hi, again. I really wish you'd pick up. I'd love to hear from you. It's kind of weird doing this without you. He pauses. We did some light exploring today. I just drove around and looked at the buildings. We found the gallows where they hung all those kids. It was pretty brutal. There were rotten stools under the nooses for the kids to stand on. I'm not sure if it was real, though. Somebody from the website could have come out here and tied the rope to it for authenticity or whatever. Anyway, we're going to rest up at the motel and keep going tomorrow. I'll talk soon, I hope. Voicemail sent May 24th, 8.01 a.m. Okay, it's 8 in the morning. Way too early in my opinion, but Tracy was too excited to go back to sleep. Tracy laughs in the background. We're driving through town right now, and I don't know, man. It definitely feels haunted. Like the vibe here is off way stronger than any place we've been to before. And dude, there's this really creepy church smack dead in the middle of town. Seriously, I'll send you a pic. It looks like they could shoot a horror movie there. There's this huge stained glass window, right? But what's really creepy, it's not Mary or some religious shit. 
it has this dude, or whatever looks like a dude, with antlers growing out of its head and bright red eyes. It's really creepy. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's not a church. Babe, remember we found those Bibles? Oh, uh, yeah, I... End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 24th, 6.33 p.m. Hey, Ethan. So, I think this place is definitely legit. We went to the church, and man, the vibe inside is even worse than outside. We heard scratching on the walls and tapping coming from the basement. It was actually creepy. Oh, don't forget to tell him about the shop. Oh, right. So, we walked into the town square, right? Kind of had an old-fashioned western feel to it. And a fountain. Yeah, there was a fountain in the middle of the square. And there was a statue with the same antler dude from the church. There was a bunch of coins in the water, like a wishing fountain. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 24th, 6.36 p.m. Fucking voicemail. I'm going to send up an auto-redial app so I don't have to worry about it. Anyway, there were coins in the fountain, but they aren't like regular U.S. currency coins. They're super old. They look like real gold, but I don't know. I'll have to test them. But they have these weird inscriptions on them with a tree insignia underneath. I tried Googling it, but I couldn't find anything. Oh, the shop. It was an old shoe shop. And after we looked back, there was a face. Uh, yeah, a creepy face. Peering through the window, staring at us. That pale as all hell. I almost passed out. But the weird part is we'd just been in there. We were just in there and no one else was inside except us. So, it was a ghost, right? It had to be. Nobody's lived here for decades. He paused. A light tapping can be heard in the background. What was that? The tapping grew louder. Do you hear that? End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 24th, 6.41 p.m. Cody and Tracy can be heard whispering to each other. What the hell is going on? I'm getting really creeped out. I thought no one lived here. No one does. The tapping grows insistent, turns into aggressive pounding. Dude, what the hell? The banging continues for several moments, then ceases. Cody's breathing can be heard as he walks to the door and opens it. Hello? Silence. Is someone out there? Silence. Then the door closes. Well, uh, I guess we're going to bed now. Talk tomorrow. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 1.01 p.m. We're currently standing in the meat shop where the butcher had chopped up all the kids after the town hung them. Don't be gross. What? It actually happened. Or so they say. It just feels disrespectful. Murdering children, then eating them, is also disrespectful. Didn't the butcher also go all a Jack the Ripper with the woman in the town? Yeah, yeah, I guess that guy didn't really have a type. Tracy laughs. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 2.04 p.m. Okay, we're in the school now. It's surprisingly well preserved. There's even still chalk on the blackboard. Kind of spooky. Can you read it, Trace? I can't. No, I can't tell what it says. Wait. She pauses for a moment. Then she gasps. What? What does it say? It says... You're a nerd. Tracy laughs loudly. Ha ha ha, you're so funny. You love it. They kiss. Did you hear that? End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 2.09 p.m. Hello? A child's giggle can be heard. Is there someone here? 
Tracy gasps. Holy shit. You shouldn't be here. We shouldn't? Why not? They don't want you here. Who doesn't want us here? You'll find out. They're not going to let you leave now. You should have left. The child giggles again, and small footsteps can be heard running out of the room. Hey! End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 6.21 p.m. Cody sighs. We're back in the motel now. We tried looking for the kid, but we couldn't find her. Which is kind of unnerving, because there aren't many places to hide here. She was a ghost, Cody. They aren't always corporeal. That's true. He paused. Do you really think she was a ghost? You said it yourself. No one's lived here for decades. And the society says it's one of the most haunted places in the country. Did you really think we'd come here without seeing anything? Uh, Kind of. I didn't even know if I believe in ghosts. Are you serious? You've been ghost hunting all your life. We never exactly found anything. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 6.32 p.m. Do you think we should leave? Do you? I don't know. I'm getting kind of creeped out, Cody. All this feels a little too real. Yeah, I felt it too. This place is way more intense than anywhere else Ethan and I have gone. We'll leave in the morning, okay? Okay. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 26th, 5.01 p.m. Cody, panting. Get in the car. Ethan, something really wrong is going on here. This place is real. Everything you said was right. They were right. He opens his truck. The beeping from the open door can be heard as he talks. We went back to the church. We went back to the day of church. Babe, please drive. Please go. Two door slams. The engine starts. There were people in the basement. They were singing some kind of song. He hums part of a song. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 26th, 5.06 p.m. God, they killed her. They killed her. And then they cut her up. And Cody, Cody, look. Oh my God. Drive, drive, Cody. Their engine gets loud enough to cut off their panicked voices for a moment. Cody, Cody, watch out. Tracy screams, and then there is a loud crash. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 26th, 5.10 p.m. Cody can be heard groaning. Oh, shit. My head. A pause. Tracy. Tracy. The car door opens. What the hell? Oh, what the hell? No, no, let me go. Let me go. Tracy, Tracy, wake up. Tracy. Cody's screams fade as he's pulled away from the truck. There is silence for several moments. Then the phone jostles and heavy breathing can be heard. Someone laughs into the receiver. End of voice message. That's the last of them. I've listened to the voicemails hundreds of times now. I'm really freaked out. There was no attempted contact after the last one. No more calls, no texts, nothing at all. I went to the police, but they said because they went missing in another state, all they could do was contact a local police department and have them send someone out. I'm going to go look for them. I don't know if that's the best decision, but maybe if I had gone with them in the first place, this wouldn't have happened. If I'd gone with them, they might not have disappeared. It should only take me a couple days to get to Site 49. I'll keep you guys updated with what I find. Two days after I made my last post, I made it to the motel Cody and Tracy were staying at. 
It was a beat-down piece of shit about 15 miles outside of Site 49, but it wasn't too far, so I could see why they chose it. I walked inside the small office and rang the bell for the clerk. A man in his late thirties came out of a back room with a door marked Employees Only. He was wearing a dirty wife beater and had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I eyed the sign on the counter that read, No Smoking, and quirked my brow with the clerk. You need a room? He grumbled. His voice was thick and gruff, probably from all the cigarettes. I nodded. Fifteen for the hour, forty for the night. I swallowed back the distaste in my mouth. They rented rooms by the hour? This place was definitely a shithole. I pulled my wallet from my back pocket and grabbed two twenties from the small number of bills I had inside. The man slid them off the counter and tucked them into his pocket. He turned his back for a moment to the row of keys hanging on the clips behind the counter and plucked the one marked 14. He handed it to me. One more thing, I said. I unlocked my phone and pulled up the picture I had of Cody and Tracy on the screen. Have you seen these two? The clerk's face turned sour. Yeah, they were here about a month ago. Stiffed me for a night. Do you know where they went? No idea. All I know is I'm out of money for their room. Are you here to settle their tab? I opened my mouth to protest, but the next motel wasn't for another ten miles, and I doubted he would give me back the money I'd already paid. How much do they owe? The man smirked. Sixty. Bullshit, I said, then bit my tongue. The clerk noticed. Cleaning fee. You can either pay me what I'm owed, or you can find another establishment to stay at. I held back the comment I wanted to make about how this seedy garbage fire was a far cry from being considered an establishment, and coughed up the extra money. Pleasure doing business with you. I walked back outside, where my car was the only one parked in the lot. It seemed most other people were willing to drive the extra twenty or so minutes. I put my key in the lock of room 14 and jiggled the knob when it stuck. The room was what you'd expect, so long as you had really low expectations. The walls were nicotine-stained, the suggestion of their previously white coating long gone. The carpet was green and so old it looked like it had a stain to mark every year since its installation. I didn't even want to think about the state of the bed. I walked over to it and lifted the blankets to check for bed bugs. When I didn't find any, I peeled back the sheets to check for stains. Surprisingly, they looked clean, new. I kicked off my shoes and crawled under the covers, tucking them under my folded arms. If I was being honest, I was scared to go to Site 49. As much as I wanted to find my brother and Tracy, and I did, I was desperate to. I was also terrified. I didn't know what had happened to them. Who had taken them, or what. But what if I couldn't save them? What if they were dead? But what if... And I hated myself for being such a coward to even think this. But what if whatever got them, got me, too? It was hot when I woke up the next morning. The AC kicked off at some point during the night, and it was at least 76 degrees in there. I flung the covers off and swung my legs over the bed. I peeled my sweaty shirt from my back and stood. I felt and smelled disgusting. I didn't know if I trusted the shower enough to use it, so I walked to the bathroom and flicked on the light. It was surprisingly clean, so I hopped in and showered in cold water before I got dressed in the clean clothes tucked away in my duffel bag. I towel-dried my hair quickly and grabbed my keys from the table by the door. Here we go. I left in the late morning, the sun blazing high in the cloudless sky. The drive wasn't too bad. It took about twenty minutes to get to the coordinates of Site 49. I pulled up to a building on the outskirts of the town and turned off my engine. I steeled my nerves for several moments. I could do this. I had to. No one else knew they were here. No one else would be able to save them. 
It had to be me. It could only be me. I got out of the car. Immediately the heat beat down on me, arid warmth searing my exposed skin. Cody was right. It was hot. I approached the building I parked my car next to. The windows were coated in grime, but after wiping it off with my hand, I cleared enough to peer inside. It looked like an apothecary. Large cabinets with small drawers, housing bottles of medicine lining the walls around the room. There were rows of shelves next to the counter, mason jars filled with pig feet and cow's tongue. I made a face and backed away from the store. I doubted they were in there. I walked down the wooden steps and back out onto the dusty road. They could be anywhere. I didn't even know where to start. You shouldn't be here. I stared and whipped around, looking into the face of a child. A young girl. Was she the same one from Cody's voicemail? You shouldn't be here. She was very pale and very thin. She looked malnourished, like she hadn't eaten in weeks. Maybe longer. Her hair was mousy and thin, bald patches marking parts of her scalp. I couldn't tell if she was real or not, just like Cody couldn't. Cody wasn't lying when he said we'd never really seen any evidence of the supernatural on our trips. Occasionally, we'd hear scratching, and sometimes breathing, but we usually just chalked that up to the power of suggestion. Over the course of our lives and the years we'd spent tracking down things that shouldn't exist, we never found any concrete evidence that they did actually exist. So when looking at this child, this dirty, hungry child, I didn't see a ghost. I saw a poor kid that needed to eat. I'm looking for my brother and his girlfriend, I said. Have you seen him? I pulled out my phone and showed her the same picture I'd shown the clerk at the motel last night. The girl's face remained expressionless. She stared at the picture for a while, though, longer than would be normal if she didn't know them. I told them they shouldn't be here, she said. What? You remember them? Do you know where they are? I crouched down to her level and firmly grabbed her by the arm. I looked into her face. Please, I have to find them. They're in danger. Please, tell me where they are. I told them they shouldn't be here. The girl said again. Then she cupped my face with her small hand. And neither should you. Now you're stuck here, just like them. Then she grinned at me, a rotten, blackened horror, and widened her jaws to bite my arm. I screamed and tried to shake her off, but she was latched on with the ferocity of something much stronger than someone as small as she was. I yanked on her hair, but as it did, it came out as a thick clump in my hand. What the hell? She took another bite, and when her jaws were briefly unclamped, I grabbed the back of her neck and thrusted her away from me. She fell onto her back and rolled into a crouch. She snarled at me, baring her bloodied teeth as she prepared to pounce. I looked around for something, anything that I could use. I spotted a large rock and snatched it up. When she was almost on me, I smashed her over the head with it. Her head made an awful, cracking noise, and she fell to the ground with a heavy thud. She was still twitching when I got to my feet. I panted heavily and tore off the bottom of my t-shirt to wrap over the bite marks on my arm. They were deep, oozing blood down my hand so that it dripped onto the dusty ground beneath my tennis shoes. The girl grinned and tried to move, but she couldn't. Either the hit had paralyzed her or she was too weak to do anything. I rolled her over onto her back. Where are they? I growled between clenched teeth. She took gasping, wheezing breaths as she laid there on the ground. I thought for a moment she was too weak to even speak. But then she looked right into my eyes and said, You should have left when you had the chance. And then she laughed, that high, childish giggle that I'd heard in Cody's voicemail. 
I gripped the rock harder and smashed her in the head with it again. Once, twice, three times, until she stopped laughing and her brain matter looked like ground meat. I stumbled to my feet, breathing hard, and let the stone fall from my hand. And then, I vomited. I braced my hands on my knees as my body convulsed, the force of it arching my back so that my stomach upended its contents. They landed on the remains of the dead girl. I vomited some more. Eventually, I stopped puking, and I spit a few times to get the acrid taste out of my mouth. I'd just murdered someone. A little girl. I felt dirty, tainted, like I'd lost some pivotal part of myself that I'd never get back. And I would never get it back. I sniffed hard and wiped my mouth. I had to go. Whatever I had done, it paled in comparison to what would happen to Cody and Tracy if I didn't find them. I swung around, looking at all the buildings in this crazy town, thinking desperately about where they could be. And then, I spotted it in the distance. The church. A big, hulking thing with tall spires piercing the sky. I knew immediately that that was where they were. I threw open my car door and shoved my keys into the ignition. The engine caught and I pressed hard on the accelerator as I whipped the steering wheel around. It took about two minutes to get to the church. I slammed on the brakes and flung the door open. The church was a large structure, made mostly of stone. Most of the windows didn't have glass. Rusted metal bars crossed over the openings. As I stared up at the church, my fervent anger faltered for a brief moment. As I was confronted one more time, with the enormity of what I could be walking into. And then I heard my brother's voice in that last voicemail, panicked and terrified, helpless. I yanked open the heavy wooden doors. They swung wide, a mouth yawning open to inhale that which chose to enter it. I walked inside. It was quiet. Most places this far removed from society usually were. The freedom from noise pollution provided a profound lacking that was as noticeable as any sound. There were rows and rows of wooden pews standing at attention and facing the front of the church. There was a podium at the tip of a raised dais, a large and leaden-looking book laid open on top. And behind it where there should be a cross hanging from the wall with Jesus mounted to it. There was nothing. Instead, there was a large tree, its limbs outstretched and reaching for the ceiling. The face of the man with the antlers was carved into the trunk. With such acute detail, it looked like he had been real once and had melded with the tree over time, until they were one and the same. Staring at that tree felt wrong, like I was peering into something that wasn't meant for me. I felt like I was staring at a millennia of history, but this history was only for a certain kind of person. It had spent all of those years growing around me, unfurling itself in directions I had never gone, its path far removed from my own. Until now, when we had reached our convergence point... My shoes scuffled against the concrete floor. I took small steps until I reached the dais, and I climbed the steps to the podium. I looked at the book and ran my fingers over the insignia of the tree that was so significant to this town. I flipped the book open to the middle. There was a picture of a man holding a woman in his arms. He held her face up to his, and for a moment it looked like they were kissing. And then I realized he was eating her. His teeth dug into the skin of her cheek, and the picture was so detailed I could see the sinewy strings of her exposed flesh. Under the picture, there was an inscription that read, The man celebrates the sacrifice of the woman by treasuring her offering. I stepped away from the book in disgust. Everything pointed more and more to this place being the home of a cult. And not just a cult, 
but a cannibalistic one. I thought of the girl I had killed, and how she had taken a couple chunks out of my arm, how she had looked malnourished, like she hadn't eaten in a very long time, and Cody and Tracy being kidnapped after they had come to this very church. And then it hit me. This place was never abandoned. The people that lived here had never left. I heard music, then. The muffled sound of piano keys being gently stroked somewhere beneath my feet. It was a slow song. A song that meandered through its tempo instead of rushing through it. I looked around, trying to find a way to the lower levels of the church. There was a door that, from the position of the podium, was hidden behind the tree. I walked over to it, resting my ear against the wood to listen for the music. It was coming from there. I twisted the knob and pulled the door open just a crack. It led to a stairwell that was dark and dank. I stepped inside and went down the stairs, pausing at the landing to peer around the corner. It led to more stairs. As I walked down, I could hear the gentle humming of voices I couldn't hear before. They droned in unison, the melody haunting and eerie. It sounded like the same song Cody had hummed in his voicemail. I reached the bottom of the stairs. A long stone hallway stretched before me, several doors leading off on both sides. But the music was coming from the door straight ahead. So that was the one I moved toward. The music was picking up pace, the humming more erratic. They were grunting now, yelling, desperation lilting the notes as they sang them. I shivered with revulsion. There was something so wrong about this song. Something off. It felt unholy, like it was sucking all of the good from the air, replacing it with something dark, something sinister. I reached the door. The music was at its height, the rhythm cresting to its crescendo that sounded like a pulsating heartbeat. And then, with a final, anguished cry, it ceased. The door was parted slightly. I peered inside at the scene beyond. It was similar to upstairs, but smaller. There were several wooden pews set in a line on either side of the aisle, big enough for the two or three people sitting inside them. The room was well lit, with dozens of candles. A woman stood in the front, clearly respected, as every person's eyes were trained on her. She held her arms aloft, her blood-red chasuble obscuring the table behind her. Today we celebrate the gifts that our gracious Lord has sent to us, she said, her voice clear and strong. In times of difficulty, such as we have been in for these past many years, we need only pray to the Savior, our Lord, who has blessed us and blessed us again. People in the pews were nodding and beating the air with their hands. He is forgiving, our Lord, and through his mercy we have this bountiful reward. She gestured behind her and moved so that the room could see. There was a large mica table on a raised stone floor. The body of a heavy-set man was strapped to the table. My stomach lurched. The man was still alive, fighting sluggishly against the leather straps that bound his hands and feet. Were they going to kill him? Was this a sacrifice for their so-called god? The woman brandished a glass knife from inside her sleeve and moved around to the other side of the table. As her hem grazed the floor, I could finally see the face of the person they had strapped down. I had to clamp my hand over my mouth to keep from screaming. It was Cody. It was my brother. We thank thee, O Lord, for blessing us with that which will sustain us beyond our tribulations. Oh my God, they were going to kill him. I cast a panicked glance at the people in the pews, their thinning hair, the bones of their backs visible through their shirts. They were going to eat them. 
the woman plunged the knife into Cody's sternum and dragged it down to his belly button. He screamed through the gag in his mouth, but she just smiled and tore further down to his waistband. Blood poured onto the table and leaked onto the floor where there were bowels to catch the drippings from my brother. She peeled back his skin to reveal his intestines, which she took out and put on plates that were lined up on the table. She licked the blood off of her fingers. Cody was dead before she finished. I fell to my knees and dry heaved, my stomach empty from earlier when I killed the girl. My head was buzzing, and I felt like I was on the verge of insanity. How could someone's life end like that? So cruelly, and so suddenly. The only reason I didn't charge into that room is because there were too many of them, and I knew I would end up like Cody if I did. And then I remembered Tracy. I had to find Tracy. I didn't know if she was still alive or if they'd already eaten her, but I had to find her. I knew Cody would want me to. I stumbled to my feet, leaning on the wall to steady myself. I faced the wall back to the stairwell, and I eyed the door, having no idea which one Tracy would be in. There were so many. Where was I supposed to start? I picked one at random. There were beds inside. Four of them positioned across from each other. They were made up neatly the cleanliness suggesting normalcy these people did not possess. I left the door open and tried another room. Another bedroom. And another. And another. How many people lived here? I tried a door that led to an office. Through it, I could see a smaller door. I ran over to it, hoping it wasn't just a closet. It wasn't. There was a smaller staircase that led down into pitch-black darkness. I glanced behind me quickly to make sure no one had seen me, and I closed the door quietly behind me as I stood on the landing of the stairs. I pulled out my phone. I needed to call the police. It was too much. It ran so deep, and I would be lucky if I made it out alive. I checked the reception in the corner. No signal. Of course. I pushed out a shaky breath and descended the stairs. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and pointed it in front of me. I was in a basement. The floors were dirty and there were several wooden posts holding up the ceiling. There was blood on the ground. I couldn't help but think about how it was Cody's. How he'd resisted them. And how they'd probably beaten him for it. I shook my head. Now wasn't the time to think about that. His death would mean nothing if Tracy died too. A muffled scream and the rattle of chains. I swung the flashlight around, looking for the sound. There, in the far corner of the basement, was Tracy. She was crying and tugging on the chains desperately. I rushed over to her and pulled the gag from her mouth. Ethan... Oh, God, Ethan, they took Cody. They took him. You have to find him. I tried not to look at Tracy, but I knew she should know. Tracy. I started, but I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. I couldn't say it out loud. I didn't want to make it any more real than it already was. We stared at each other for several beats, and I watched as the realization dawned on her. No. She sobbed and shook her head as more tears fell. He was just here, right here. I grabbed Tracy's face and forced her to look at me. Oh, Tracy, we need to focus. The last thing Cody would want is for us to die too. We have to get out of here. For him. She nodded but kept crying. I pointed the flashlight at the cuffs. There were leather at her wrists, but metal where they were looped around on the wooden posts. They had a keyhole to unlock them, but I doubted I would find it down here. I need to find something to get you free, I told Tracy. No, no, you can't leave me here, she pleaded. 
I'll be right back. We're not getting out of here if I can't get the cuffs off. She begged me not to go, but I ignored her as I ran up the stairs. When I got to the top, I turned the flashlight off and looked through the door. The office was clear. I rifled in the drawers of the desk for the key, but they were empty. There was nothing in the room I could use, either. Shit, I muttered. I would have to go back out into the hall and search the bedrooms. My stomach churned as I grabbed the door handle. I really hoped they were still congregating in the other room. I turned the knob and had just started to open the door when I heard voices outside. I froze, not daring to move, not daring to breathe. The people were talking and laughing, sounding giddy and happy as they walked down the hallway. I was filled with rage in that moment, a feeling so primal I felt I could rip their throats out with my teeth. My brother was dead because of them. They feasted on his flesh and thanked some god for it. These people, this cult, had destroyed the most significant part of my life. I wanted to burn them to the ground. The voices faded, but I waited several minutes before I left. There was no one in the hallway when I checked, and before I could think too much about it, I ran to one of the bedrooms. I shut the door quickly behind me and wasted no time in looking for something to free Tracy. I searched through the bedside tables and under the beds, but there was nothing. I looked in the wardrobe. Apart from a few ragged dresses, it was empty. And then I saw a glint of metal underneath one of the pillows. I pulled it out. It was a small switchblade. I turned to leave when the door flung open. I dropped to the floor and crawled under one of the beds. My heart thudding so painfully in my chest, I thought it would soon burst its way out. I could see small feet enter the room and hoist themselves onto the bed. They swung their feet back and forth for a moment, humming the song they'd all been singing before they murdered Cody. It was so disorienting to see this small child behaving so normally, so much like other small children, but knowing they had just been eating my brother not ten minutes before. Suddenly, the child let out a pained howl and ran from the room. Who stole my knife? It yelled. Who took it? It hollered again and again, demanding to know who stole its knife. And then its shrill voice turned into a constant screaming as it stood there and shrieked in the hallway. Hey, calm down. What happened? A more adult voice soothed, trying to calm the child. And my knife is gone. The child cried. We'll find it. Don't worry. The child's sob faded as it was led away. I rolled out from under the bed and hid behind the door for a moment. After I determined the hall was clear, I ran back to the office and to the little door. By the time I got to Tracy, she looked wild with fright. I heard a scream. I thought they got me. I started cutting the leather that bound her wrists. I'm fine, I said not daring to think too much about whether or not that was true. Now wasn't the time. After a few moments, I freed Tracy, and together we sprinted up the stairs. I pushed her behind me and confirmed the coast was clear. We dashed into the hall and moved towards the other staircase that led into the upper levels of the church. Did you take my knife? My stomach plummeted. We turned around, Slowly, now, face to face with a little boy. He peered at us, curiously. A small smile played about his mouth. Yes, uh, I did, I said. I grabbed the knife from my pocket and held it out to him, my other hand up to placate him as if he were a cougar I'd encountered in the woods. If I give it back to you, will you promise not to say anything? The kid nodded and took the knife. He stared at us as if we were some wonder on display in a museum. Then he grinned, a horrible, 
and bloody smile and screamed. People rushed out of their rooms and stopped when they spotted us. We stood at a stalemate for a moment, the tension in the hall thick and charged. Then we ran. Tracy and I bolted up the stairs and out of the church. We rushed down the row of pews, her hand in mine, gripping me so tight I felt she might break it. We skirted around the benches and bolted over the carpeted aisle. We'd nearly made it to the door when she was pulled from me. Ethan? She shrieked, her arms flailing as she tried to grab me. A huge man with stringy hair was dragging her back toward the dais. I tried to pull her from him, but he was too strong. He held her with one hand and shoved me to the floor with the other. I rolled to my feet and looked for something, anything I could use against him. But at that moment, the rest of the people from under the stairs burst out onto the dais, dozens of them crowding around each other, staring at me and Tracy hungrily. Stay there, the man said to me, and held his hand under Tracy's chin. I took a step forward, unsure of what I was planning to do. The man dug his fingers into the skin of Tracy's throat. She cried out in pain. He dragged his nails across her neck, slowly, blood trickling down to rest in the dip of her collarbone. Let her go, I shouted, but the man just smiled. Tracy bucked wildly and kicked off of one of the pews. They crashed to the ground. The man's head cracked against the concrete floor. Blood bloomed where his head made contact. I grabbed Tracy and yanked her up. We ran to the door of the church. The people from below, right behind us. We rushed to the car and fell inside. I rammed the keys into the ignition and stomped on the gas. The people swarmed out to meet us, running at the car and beating on the windows. One of them broke the glass on the driver's side. He tried to pull me from the car, but I tightened my grip on the wheel with one hand and punched at him erratically with the other. He laughed. I recognized that laugh. It was the one from Cody's voicemail. The one who dragged him from the car. He was the reason my brother died. I slammed on the brakes. The man flew off the car, the momentum tossing him forward so that he crashed to the ground. I flung the door open, ignoring Tracy as she screamed at me to get back inside. I straddled the man on the ground and grabbed him by the collar. I didn't say anything. I hit him. And then I hit him again, over and over, until his face was so bloody I could barely tell there was a person underneath it. I didn't know if he was breathing anymore. I didn't care. I pulled my fist back to hit him again, but Tracy stopped me. Ethan, we have to go. They're coming. I looked behind us, where the other cultists were closing the lead we had gained in the car. I swore under my breath and looked down at the man not getting the satisfaction I was hoping from his bloodied face. Tracy and I bolted back inside and peeled off across the dirt. We drove away from the town. Some of the cultists tried to give chase, but they couldn't keep up on foot. We watched them fade in the rearview mirror, trying to wave us down, trying to get us to turn around. Starve, you fucks. I didn't let up off the gas until the town was miles away, the sunlight receding against our backs. After a while, I found the ability to speak. So, uh, can I ask? I hesitated, unsure how to phrase my next question. I looked at Tracy and eyed her up and down. Are you asking how I got fat? She said, an eyebrow quirked. I, well, she stared at her lap and picked at the skin around her fingernails. They fed us when we were down there, she whispered. I was about to question if they fed her what they were eating, people, but she cut me off. Not human meat. It was this nasty green stuff they forced down our throats with a tube. It was hard to choke down but they made us drink every last drop. We fell into silence, 
my anger boiling my blood. Those people, they prepared them like pigs for slaughter, force-fed them to fatten them up to get a higher yield. Bile rose in my throat, and I had to push past the urge to puke. I clenched the steering wheel so tightly I thought my knuckles would shatter under my grip. I whipped the car into the parking lot of a local grocery store and threw the gear into park. What are you doing? Get out, I said, and leaned over to open Tracy's door. What? I said, get out. I grabbed my phone from my pocket and folded it in Tracy's fingers. Go inside. Stay with people. Call the cops and tell them to meet me at the church. You're... you're going back? Are you crazy? Maybe, but I don't care. I'm gonna burn that town to the fucking ground. I drove to a nearby gas station. I had to map quest it because I was in the middle of nowhere and I didn't know where anything was. I charged inside the store and nodded at the guy behind the counter. Gas cans? In the corner, he answered, barely glancing up from his phone. I grabbed four gas cans off the shelf and walked up to the register. I held one up. I got four, I said. The clerk tapped on the screen a few times and then looked at me. 2164. He watched me take the money from my wallet, and I couldn't tell if he was staring at me suspiciously or if it was just a smudge on the dirty plexiglass distorting his face. I avoided eye contact. Keep the change, I said, and stepped out, using my back to open the door as the clerk droned to have a nice day. Not likely. I filled the gas cans at the pump, impatiently tapping my fingers on the roof of the car. I screwed the cap onto the last can and tossed it in the trunk, slamming the door and getting into the driver's seat. I pulled out of the parking lot and turned in the direction of Site 49, pressing hard on the accelerator. If the cops pulled me over, I'd bring them with me. I wasn't nervous this time. I wasn't sick to my stomach or ruminating over every possible thing that could go wrong. I didn't care what happens to me. I wanted to destroy them and everything they had. And if I died, so be it. By the time I got there, it was well into the night. I shut off my headlights a few hundred yards from the outskirts of the town and pulled up slowly. There wasn't any noise or light. There wasn't any sign that there were people living there. It looked like what they wanted it to, an abandoned settlement that didn't deserve to be looked twice at. There was no sign of the lives they led below. I grabbed two of the gas cans from the trunk. I set one behind the building, along the rear wall, and walked back around to the front. I pulled open the door to the apothecary. A strange sense of disillusionment came over me. I had just been there earlier that day. I had peered through the window, not knowing what I know now, not having seen what I'd seen. My brother was still alive the last time I had been in this building. I let the door close behind me. I checked to make sure no one was coming this way, that I hadn't been seen. Then I unscrewed the lid to the can. I dumped the contents out, drenching the cracked wooden slats that made up the floor of the store. I tossed some on the walls, on the counters, every surface, until I bled the can dry. I tossed the can to the ground, and it made a wet, squelching sound when it landed. Then, I stepped back outside, checking again that the area was clear. I stood beyond the puddles of gas and took the matches from my pocket. I struck one and held it up, staring briefly into the small flame, thinking about the repercussions I would be facing after I did this. I smiled, and then I dropped the match. Fire blazed to life, flames licking their way through the apothecary, dancing around the floor and bounding up the walls. The wood was so dry that it didn't take long for the entire building to go up. 
After a moment, the windows shattered, and I covered my eyes with my arm. I watched for several moments, mesmerized by the beauty of this destruction. And then, someone screamed. The well! Go get water! I ducked behind the burning building, the heat kissing my skin as I raced around to the other side. People were running with small pails of water, trying in vain to save it. I watched with relish as they dashed back and forth. They lugged the water from the well, not accepting the fact that the structure was done for. Some of them stood in groups and hugged one another. Their sobs filled the air over the sound of the roof caving and crashing to the foundation. Who did this? A woman screamed. Who did this? No one said anything. They just continued to hold each other as tears ran down their faces. The yelling woman let out a frustrated cry and stomped her way back to the church. The rest stayed and watched as the fire continued to taste the night. I picked up the gas can I had set behind the store earlier and then dove around the conjuring building beside it. I was out of the cultist's eye line when I got to the other side, so I ran from building to building until I hit the stretch of dirt path that led up to the church. A fierce satisfaction shocked my nerves. Righteous anger coursed through my body, lighting my cells so that I felt like I could tear the world down with only my fingers. I had caused them pain. I had caused them suffering. I wanted to cause more. They didn't notice me as I made my way to the church. To this day, I'm still unsure how. Surely someone was watching the blaze through the window. But no one stopped me. If I was noticed, I was allowed to pass. Maybe they wanted me to. I opened the door of the church slowly, peering inside of the crack to determine it was empty. The door made a soft whoosh noise as it closed behind me, sucking the air in the room with it. I prowled down the aisle, my step determined and sure. I uncapped the gas can as I walked up the steps to the dais. I poured a puddle in front of the door leading down to the lower levels, cutting off their exit, condemning them to death. I hadn't seen another way out when I was down there, and Tracy hadn't said one existed. I hoped it didn't. After I drenched the carpet, I poured the rest of the gas on the tree. I made sure to douse the face of the thing in the tree, as if it were alive, as if I could drown it in penance for what it had done, for the pain it had caused, for the pain it had caused me. I stepped back to admire what I'd done. The wood was soaked, ready to combust under the ignition from my match. I pulled the pack out from my pocket and flicked one across the strike pad. It didn't take. I tried again. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I flinched and spun around. The priestess stood before me, her posture placid. Her fingers laced together as she looked up at me with soft amusement. This was the woman who led the ritual. The woman who killed my brother. The woman who licked his blood off of her fingers as if he'd been a tasty midday snack. And why's that? I said, my voice steady even as my hands shook. My anger flared boiling beneath my skin until I could feel the heat of it lighting my brain on fire. I wanted to rip her eyes from her head and force them down her throat. I could see on her face that she knew what I was thinking. She took a step closer, daring me to. To put it simply, you'll die. She quirked her head to the side, staring at me curiously the way a bird stares at a worm before it plucks it into its mouth to taste it. It was the same gesture the little boy had done earlier. I wondered if she was his mother. What makes you think I care if I die? I said. I don't believe you do. She was at the steps of the dais now. But it serves our purposes better if you don't. What the hell does that mean? Let me guess, she said, a playful tone edging her voice now. 
the boy I killed. He was family. I didn't say anything. I just continued to stare at her as she further closed the space that separated us. A brother, perhaps. Her hands were clasped behind her back now, that same sardonic tilt of her lips plastered on her face. I narrowed my eyes at her. It felt like she was a lion, prowling forward to test the waters before she pounced and drowned me beneath the surface. You know, he fulfilled his purpose, his destiny. He was fated to be brought here, to provide succor to those who would have perished had he not. To be brought here, I said, my mind snagging on the phrase. Who brought him here? Why, the glory of the Lord, of course, she said, and gestured to the tree I had soaked moments before. We serve him, and he protects us. He picks us up when we fall. He brings us back from the edge, over and over again. Lord knows we don't deserve it, but the Lord is a forgiving Lord. I rolled my eyes and scoffed. Rage coursed her face, a sharp and rapid reaction to my dismissal of the thing she dedicated her life to. Her shoulders tightened and her mouth stiffened. You dare disrespect the Lord, she said, her voice low and quaky. I could hear the anger simmering low in her throat. I grinned at her. Lady, fuck your God. She screamed then, an unnaturally high, pitching shriek that splintered the air and brought me to my knees. I covered my ears with my hands as she brought a blade out from behind her back and raised it above her head. She ran at me, still emitting that shrill wail. The cultists who were outside ran in, the rest of them coming up from under the church at the sound of their leader calling them forth. They stood at attention, waiting for the priestess to need them. She stabbed at me with the knife. I let go of my ears to grab her hand. She pointed the tip over my chest where my heart was, pushing into the butt of it with her other hand. She was strong, much stronger than I would have ever thought. We stood in a deadlock for a moment. I stared into her face. From further away, she looked normal, like a regular person. But up close, her skin was thin and translucent, her teeth sharp and pointed. Her eyes were almost fully black. There was only a thin, red line at the edge of the large pupil. My arms trembled from the effort of pushing her back. She started to gain traction, the tip of the blade edging closer and closer. The members had joined hands and were swaying. Their eyes closed and their voices joined together to sing out that same haunting melody I had heard just earlier that day. I had to do something. I had to do it now. I smashed my forehead against her nose. She stumbled back, blood flowing down her face like the current carries a river. She wiped her face with her sleeve, the blood barely visible on the red of her shirt. She spat on the floor. You'll regret that. And then she threw the knife. It carried through the air, end flying over end, and I had barely a moment to move before it buried itself into my shoulder. I cried out in pain, my hand shaking as I raised it to the knife. My shirt was soaked in a matter of moments. The priestess cackled. Then she charged at me. I held out an arm to stop her, but it was useless. She knocked me aside and grabbed the hilt of the knife. She twisted it. The pain seared deep beneath my skin, the tissue grinding and grating against the serrated metal. I was blinded for a moment, everything white and hazy as I dropped to my knees. She pushed the knife in the rest of the way and then yanked it out. I braced myself against the floor and gasped. I had never felt such intense pain before. My shoulder throbbed and I could hear my heart beat in my ears. I looked up at the priestess. She dragged the knife across her tongue, a red streak of my blood left behind. She took her tongue back into her mouth 
and swallowed. Your brother tasted better. I wrapped my arms around her knees and shoved her to the ground. We crashed to the floor, our limbs tangling and our heads budding. She elbowed me in the face. My nose cracked under the impact and I tasted copper in my teeth. I punched at her messily, my fist landing lightly on her ribs and chest. She grabbed my hair and pulled my head back to stare into my eyes. I'm going to enjoy eating you. She opened her mouth and positioned it over my neck. Time seemed to slow down, and I felt every second as she clamped her jaws into my flesh. The cultists had grown louder, their song booming around us to the erratic pace of my heart. Her teeth grazed my skin, and then she bit down. She tore at the skin of my throat, and I screamed as she ripped it out. A burning heat spread along my neck. I put my hand over the wound and looked at the priestess. She chewed me deeply, savoring the taste. She pulled my hand away and went for another bite. I punched her in the face. One time, two, three, stunning her enough for me to shove her onto her back. She tried to hit me but I pushed her arms back and held them down. Then I saw the knife. It was lying about a foot away on the carpet of the dais. I knocked her head into the floor and grabbed the knife. I stared into her creepy, black eyes as I shoved it into her sternum. She screamed, but I only pushed it in further, twisting it the way she had done to me. I yanked it out and did it again. And then... I noticed the gatherers had stopped singing. Some of them were crying, and others were looking at me with intense hatred. I could tell they wanted to kill me. One of the men took a step forward. Before he could take another, I grabbed the matches from my pocket and struck one. The flame danced gently in the stuffy air of the church. I took a few steps back, out of the area that was soaked in gasoline. The man stopped. He looked down at where he was standing. Then he looked back up at me and widened his eyes. His arms held aloft, as if to pacify me. The cultists who were at the door of the church had rushed up the dais. They began to climb it, heading for me, trying to get to me before I could set this place on fire. I looked back at the man. I bared my teeth at him. I dropped the match. It only took a few seconds for the tree to go up in flames. The fire blazed toward the ceiling, the searing heat singeing my eyes so that I had to take a step back. The fire formed a half circle on the dais, blocking in all the parishioners on the other side, trapping them. They couldn't go back down into the church, and they couldn't step off of the dais. They screamed and congregated in the middle, the part that was untouched by the fire. The area was too small for all of them, so they pushed the outliers into the blaze. They shrieked and flailed for several moments, their flesh blistering and charring, their hair lighting up like hay. I gagged at the pungent smell. They fell to the floor, their bodies landing with heavy thuds. By the time they died, the fire made its way over the carpet to the rest of the cultists. I turned away as they, too, were consumed by the flames. The priestess laughed madly, her hysterical mirth feeling out of place in the context of this moment. She wiped tears from her eyes. You have no idea what you've just done. A deafening crack split through the room. I turned toward the tree which was splintering and breaking apart like an animal breaking out of its shell at birth. I watched, horrified, as something tore its way out. Claws came out first, long and sharp, as black as charcoal. Then its arms, which looked almost human, but the skin was scaved and oozing pus. And then its head, topped with large, stretching antlers, that bowed to the sky. The thing broke out, shattering the tree so that it flew apart,
pieces of it tearing through the room like shrapnel. It let out a thunderous roar and spread its arms wide. A long, scaled tail whipped around behind it. I stumbled, but my feet lost contact with the ground and I fell back. I plunged through the air for several moments until I made contact with something. It was the members that had gathered at the base of the dais. They broke my fall, but they didn't stop me as I crashed to the ground. Chaos. Everything was chaos. Deafening screams and cries of fright filled the room as people rushed away from the creature. They stampeded to the door of the church, trembling me where I lay. I gasped for breath, the weight of them crushing me. And then the thing advanced. It stepped on the priestess, the long claws of its foot spearing her body, impaling her. The grin was still on her face, blood bubbling out of her mouth and staining her cheeks in a mock Glasgow smile. The thing leapt off the dais and into the crowd of people. It stood at about nine feet tall, towering over them, who looked like ants beneath it. It moved to block the doors of the church. They stood huddled together, trembling as they stared up at their god. One man stepped forward. My lord, he said, his voice wavering as he clasped his hands together. He dropped to his knees. I have served you my entire life. I have done everything you've required of me. I've done everything in service of you. Please, let me leave. The thing quirked its head at the man, and I couldn't tell if it had understood him or not. Then, it grabbed the man's head and crushed him between its palms. The others tried to run away, but the thing tore through them like they were ribbon. It slashed and hacked, tearing their bodies apart as easily as scissors tear through paper. It tossed people into walls like they were rag dolls, their skulls cracking against the concrete before they fell to the floor in bloody heaps. I got to my feet, but I had nowhere to go. The fire was licking its way up the aisle of the church, and soon there would be nothing between me and this thing. I only had time to briefly wonder if it really was their god when it punched a hole through the last cultist's stomach. And then it turned to me. I had never been a religious person. I grew up atheist in a family of atheists. Church had never been a part of my life, and every time someone tried to convert me, I just nodded with humor and moved on with life. So in that moment... After all of the shit I'd just seen that day, staring into the face of this unnatural creature that shouldn't exist, it didn't occur to me to pray, to reach out to some god I had never known to save my life. Instead, my mind turned to Cody, and I had only one thought. I'll see you soon, buddy. The creature lumbered towards me, crawling on all fours with its tail swinging through the air. Its face was horrifying. It had the smooth skin of a human, but there were no nostrils where its nose should be. Its eyes were bright and blue, and they had an innocent expression in them, as if it hadn't just annihilated dozens of people minutes before. It stopped in front of me, sitting on its hind legs like a dog would when it begs for a treat. My brow furrowed. Why hadn't it killed me yet? Why was it just sitting there, watching me, observing me? It reached a claw out then, dragged a talon along my throat. The sharp tip of it nicked my neck. I trembled where I stood, barely maintaining the strength to hold myself up, closing my eyes. This was it. This was where it ended. Gunshots rang out through the church. The creature reared back and swung around with a voracious bellow. There were police standing in the doorway. Six of them, 
their guns drawn and pointed at the creature. I could see cruisers parked outside, the red and blue lights melding together to create a purple haze. The cops didn't say anything. What was there to say? They just pulled the triggers on their weapons and unloaded their clips at the creature. It howled with every piercing bullet and flinched from the impact, but it didn't seem to do anything other than piss the creature off. There was a small window in which all the cops reloaded their guns, pulling mags from their belts and shoving them into the butts of their guns. This is when the creature pounced. It bent on all fours and sprang at the men, the muscles in its haunches loading like a spring to launch it forward. It landed on one of the officers, smashing his head into the floor as it faced another cop. The man looked horrified. Terror etched into every one of his features before the creature ripped his throat out like it was tissue paper. Another of the officers pressed the barrel of a shotgun to the creature's head and wasted no time in pulling the trigger. It did nothing. The creature's skin was singed, the flesh blackened and bruised, but there was no wound. I didn't wait around to see what it did next. I looked around, searching for an exit, and then I noticed one I hadn't earlier. Where there had once been a stained glass window, there was now only a gap in the wall of the church. I clambered through it, not looking back as I did. I ran across the dirt ground towards the apothecary that I had burned down. The flames had long since died, and now it was just a smoldering pile of rubble set against the dark of the night. I stumbled past it in the direction of where I'd parked my car. I held my hand against my neck. It wasn't bleeding as much now. It felt pretty shallow. I was losing the energy to keep going, to keep fighting. I felt that if there was a bed in front of me at this moment, I could fall into it and sleep for a very long time. I hoped that that wasn't the blood loss taking. I finally made it to the car and unlocked it. I heard another cacophonous roar in the distance, and I hastened into the car. I started it and pulled out to the road, hoping the thing would let me go. I drove along for a minute or so, and then the car lurched backward. I pushed the accelerator to the floor, but it still wouldn't move. The smell of burning rubber filled the interior, and I could see smoke billowing around the front. And in the rearview mirror, there was the creature, holding the car and staring at the back of my head. I took my foot off the gas. The creature jumped onto the hood of the car. The momentum slammed me forward, and it was all I could do to bring my hands up to keep my face from smashing into the steering wheel. The creature climbed off and turned around, staring at me through the shattered windshield. It stayed like that for a good minute, and then it lumbered around to the driver's side window. It pointed at it, and then gestured at the pavement. What the hell? I pushed down on the window switch, and as it rolled down, the creature and I stared at each other. I placed my hands on the steering wheel, as if the creature was a cop, and I had just been pulled over. I wished I was somewhere so mundane right now. The creature reached out at me, again taking a talon of its claw along my neck. I turned my head away and sniffed, fear taking hold of all of the energy I had left. My muscles were taut, and my breath trembled. I almost wished the thing would kill me if it meant the end of this misery. And then, the creature pulled its claw away and turned around. It walked into the desert, its steps slow and pace measured. I watched it go until I could no longer see it. And then, I tried to start my car. It was a long shot, of course, given how horribly the creature had destroyed it. The metal was crumpled and the windshield shattered. The hood was flattened like a pancake, and when I turned the key in the ignition, my hand shook so horribly I had to hold it with my other hand to keep it still. Nothing happened. The engine didn't even make a noise. 
I had to go back and get one of the police cruisers. It took a while, the adrenaline wearing off so that everything felt twice as slow as my body moved sluggishly. When I got back to the church, I didn't go inside. I could see piles of bodies through the door, parts of people spilling out onto the steps. I fell into one of the cop cars, the keys dangling from the ignition, the headlights still on. I put the vehicle in reverse. I turned it around and sped off in the opposite direction. When I got back to the grocery store where I'd left Tracy, she was nowhere to be found. The store was closed. I think it was sometime after midnight, so I drove around until I found the police station. There were two cars in the lot, one cruiser and one civilian. I limped inside and walked up to the receptionist's counter. She took one look at me, stood quickly, and backed away. Hi, I said, my eyes drooping shut. I tried to ask her where Tracy was, but I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. The only sound that came out was slurred incoherence. I collapsed to the floor, my body refusing to fight as it forced my eyes closed. When I woke up, I was in a hospital room. I groaned and moved to cover my eyes to block out the bright ceiling lights. And that's when I noticed I was handcuffed to the bed. What the hell? I said, pulling on the metal, chaining me to the railing. Hey, you're okay. You're okay, Ethan. I looked to my right, where Tracy was sitting in a chair next to the bed. Tracy, why the hell am I handcuffed? They said it was for your protection. That was obviously bullshit, but they're the police, so I can't do much. She stood up and walked to the door, poking her head out to someone in the hallway. He's awake, she said, loud enough that I could hear it from where I lay. She came back inside the room, a cop following behind her. He was tall, with a classic look, a neat haircut held in place by gel, and stubble growing along his jaw. He looked like exactly the kind of person who would become a cop. Ethan, I'm Officer Matthews. He held his hand out for me to shake it. Hi, Officer Matthews, I said. Care to enlighten me as to why I'm handcuffed? His expression soured. He turned all business then. We're holding you until we can figure out what happened at the church. So far, you're the only witness we have. So far, I said. Officer Matthews put his hands in his pockets. We have an officer in critical care. I bit back my shock. How did anyone survive that? I looked back at Officer Matthews, and I couldn't tell for sure but it seemed like he could read what I was thinking, as if it was written plainly on my face. So, said Officer Matthews, want to tell me what happened out there? Not really, but I did. I took him through everything that happened, from the voicemails, to the first time I went to Site 49, to the second. I detailed the entire day. The more I explained, the more I could see him doubting what I was saying. Even with part of Tracy's statement corroborating mine, he still didn't believe me. Not that I could blame him. A cannibalistic cult is one thing, but a godlike creature bursting from a tree and killing dozens of people is a little more difficult to swallow. Matthews finished writing my statement on his pad and tucked it into the breast pocket of his jacket. Then he crossed his arms and stared at me. You know lying to a police officer is a crime, right? I leveled my gaze and stared into his eyes. I guess it's a good thing I'm not lying then. Matthews bit back a smirk and left the room. I turned back to Tracy. Did all of that really happen? She asked. I scoffed. Are you serious? You don't believe me either? She grabbed my uncuffed hand. I know you've been through a lot, 
We both have. She paused, and I could see her working up the courage for what she was going to say next. But sometimes, when we go through something really traumatic, I yanked my hand from hers. I know what happened. I didn't just imagine it. She didn't say anything else, and we fell into silence. I laid with my head against the pillow and faced away from Tracy. Images from that night played through my mind as clearly as if they were a movie. All of that blood, all of that carnage. I'd seen enough of it to last thirty lifetimes. After twenty or so minutes, Officer Matthews came back into the room. He was grinning. Great news. The officer in the ICU woke up, and his story matches yours. Now, you either have an incredibly detailed shared delusion that coincidentally matches up with real events, or you're telling the truth. I'm thinking it's the latter. You're free to go, Ethan. Tracy and I looked at each other. She looked shocked, like her entire universe had just been shattered. I resisted this smug smile that was trying to make its way to my face. And just like that, I said. Matthews nodded, sticking his key into the hole of the cuffs and unlocking them. To be honest, I believed your story from the start. This place is... He paused, looking for the right word. Different, to say the least. There's nothing out of the realm of possibility here. And then, he left the room, tucking the cuffs into a pouch on his belt. Tracy hugged me tightly. It took a couple of days to sort things out, but eventually Tracy and I arranged a flight to get back home. We sat together on the airplane, barely speaking, unable to pull ourselves from our disenchanted stupors. Our flight touched down, and together we walked through the airport and stepped past the automatic doors and outside. Well, I'll be seeing you. Tracy said. Then she hugged me. We held each other tightly, knowing that what she'd said was wrong. We were never going to see each other again. Maybe it would be better that way. See you later, I said, as she got into a cab. I waved at her as she pulled away and waited until she was out of sight before I got into my own. The cab dropped me off in front of my apartment. I handed him two twenties through the open passenger window and turned around to face my building. I walked inside and up the two flights of stairs to my door, feeling the exhaustion pull my shoulders tight. I took my keys out of my pocket and slid them into the deadbolt. I unlocked the door and kicked it open, welcoming the side of my apartment. But it felt different now. Hollow. The light shining through the windows felt false, too bright and too warm. All of my things were right where I'd left them, but they didn't feel like my things anymore. This life felt like it belonged to someone else. Someone from a long time ago. Someone far removed from who I was now. It's funny how it only takes a day to change that. I sat down at my desk and stared through the blinds onto the street below. A mother walked along with her child, his small hand interlocked with her larger one. On the other side of the street, a man and a woman sat and talked, laughing at each other's jokes and leaning into each other. They had no idea what was really out there, what the world was really capable of throwing at them. I pushed up the screen of my laptop and typed in the URL for the society. I had to tell them what happened. I had to warn them about Site 49, about what would happen if they went there. They had to know that some things weren't a joke, that they should tread with caution in the future. But when I hit the enter key to go to the site, this is what popped up. Error 404. Page not found. What? 
An alert popped up on my screen, telling me I had just received an email. I moved my cursor over to it and clicked on it. Dear beloved reader, Unfortunately, due to unforeseen complications, we had to shut the site down. We do not have a plan to start a new website at this time. Perhaps we will in the future. But for now, we urge you to find some other sources for all things supernatural. The internet is a vast place. We're sure you can find something that will satiate your need to know. We thank you for your support over the years, and we hope to see you again should we ever choose to bring the site back to life. I was about to click off the email, baffled at the timing of this with everything that had happened, and them shutting down the site, when I noticed the scroll bar had room to go down farther than the end of the email. I pushed the cursor down to the end, and there, at the bottom, was one last paragraph. And to Ethan, who didn't realize just how far the little flap of his wings would go. We only have one thing to say. We'll see you again. <laughs>